Hello, Ryan here and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see and let's get on with it. This week, with Invictus in full swing, we check out a brand new scout tank, plus the vehicle team update us on all things ships and vehicles. So this week's Inside Star Citizen was a look at two new vehicles in the works. Well, the first one being the RSI Lynx, which is now done and implemented and the second one being the Tumbrel Storm. Now, to begin with, they did mention that in the future, there are going to be many more reasons to use ground vehicles versus ships, like weather systems. So ground vehicles are going to be far more useful for exploring the terrain of all the various planets and moons that we have, and more to come, more in the future than they are now, aside from racing, of course, which is a big deal right now, and more in the future. But the RSI Lynx was introduced alongside the Constellation Phoenix, way back in 2014, which expands on the Phoenix's luxury and just takes it to the ground. Now, it is a variant of the Ursa Rover, but distinctively different in role and style. It is a very fancy vehicle designed to transport VIPs, so it's got a lot more elegant detailing compared to that of the Ursa. Now, one thing I noticed them mention was that the Lynx will have higher quality materials, which will play into the salvaging hull scraping system as each material will hold various values to them, and scraping the materials off of the Lynx, for example, versus an Ursa Rover, will more likely pull in a higher paycheck. Now, externally, the Lynx has some very clean lines, an interesting design for the suspension, and some really nice wheels that look very unique, plus some great windows for both the driver and passengers. As we can see in the rear, there is this large wraparound vehicle so that the passengers can take in all their scenery. Now, internally, there are two very nicely styled seats, which can swing around at the push of a button. There are two panels or TVs for your viewing pleasure, some personal storage, an area to place a 1 8 SEU box, a weapon rack and a large fridge, both with frosted glass, which is a nice touch, as well as some shelving or storage for keeping things out of sight. Now, compared to the Ursa Rover, they say that the Lynx is faster and more agile as it has less weight, but less durable. So it will be very interesting to see how this fares up in, say, the racing leagues. Will it be able to go the distance? Now, the Lynx is for people who want to be kind of chauffeured around or chauffeuring others around in luxury, maybe making business deals in the back, checking your stocks, living a nice affluent life. And personally, I am very happy that they are able now to finally get such a legacy vehicle into the game and ticked off the backlog. But gameplay wise, it is of no interest to me, as I'm not someone who wants that fanciness. Same reason I have no interest in the 890 Jump or any ship like that. However, I do think it is great for those who do. And for those of you who want to transport VIP players or NPCs around the verse, or just travel around in style, it is great for you to do so. And eventually, when it comes to missions for transporting NPCs, all these NPCs will have preferences. Some of them will want the fancy side of life, some of them will not. But having a vehicle like this, if they do want some extra luxury to their transport, I'm sure they will be willing to pay for it. Now, next up is a vehicle that I am certainly interested in. Uh, in fact, I just melted my arrow to pick one up. It is the Tumbrel Storm, which is a new light scout solo vehicle. Now, this is seen as a heavily armored reconnaissance vehicle that has a good amount of firepower and it can be ahead of the ground fleet fighting targets or holding its ground while waiting for the main force to arrive. But the Storm will be an energy-based vehicle which allows it to remain in battle for longer without needing a reload. So it has a twin barrel size three energy auto cannon. And it is really designed, they say, to support the Nova tanks in attacks. Now it is heavily inspired by the Cyclone and anime manga tanks, which I thought was quite interesting. Definitely not something we've seen in Star Citizen itself. Uh, the interior space is very small. It has a seat at the front for one driver with the driver's personal FPS weapon inside the left-hand front track housing and some of the components in the rear left track housing and rear central section of the tank as well. There is not any more interior space, but they did say that as they were creating it, they made sure that all the issues that we are seeing with the Nova tank, like how it navigates over terrain or enters and exits the ship hangars, were resolved before it entered into full production. And right now, the Tumbrel Storm is currently finishing up Greybox, and they have completed the animations and are doing the material and detail pass on the tread housing. 
and then from there it will continue through LOD0. So it is not that far off. Hopefully a 320 thing, if not earlier. But personally, I really love this vehicle. It just looks like Batman's car. And as they mentioned, it's kind of like entering a mech where you sit down and everything kind of closes in around you. Now, I really like the design. I think it's got a lot of style to it. And I do look forward to seeing this in the game and seeing what you can do with it. But that was the Tumble Stormlight Scout tank. Quite a beauty. Do let me know if you plan to pick one up or if you have already. But with that said, let us get to Star Citizen Live. So this week's Star Citizen Live was with members of the ship teams for a show dedicated to all things vehicles. Now the first question was, is there a point where there are just too many ships? And they say, no, definitely not. It is only an issue if there are too many of the same type of ship. And currently there are 197 announced and revealed ships with obviously more that we don't know about. And these are all spread over the various manufacturers with many various role types for all the various game mode types. And I personally think that as the game continues to grow in all areas of tech and professions with gameplay, and once a release candidate comes along, having a huge range of options and choice when it comes to ships and vehicles will be one aspect that will really help Star Citizen to stand out. Because every profession there will be a few options available, and all that it does is give players more choice, which is never a bad thing in my opinion. And rather than having a single ship for salvaging or for mining, we have a lot of options, and that can be basically down to preference of design. Next question is, could one manufacturer influence another, like in the real world? And they say, yes, there is no reason why not, and there is a potential for this to happen. Next question, how do you expect to work through the backlog of ships? Now, they say over the last year, they have been working to make the ship pipeline much better and more refined, with the last few ships going through this more refined pipeline. However, the bigger ships, like the capital ships, they do need a lot more resources to get them built. And where they are trying to get to is a point where they can still deliver the same amount of ships and vehicles that we have now, but also tick off one to two capital ships a year, which ultimately just requires more staff. For the last few months, they have been expanding the ship teams, as we have seen with the new Montreal ships team, plus they are looking for more vehicle artists in the UK. So as usual, it is all about the available resources and by that, they just mean staff. More staff means that they can get through the backlog while continuing to produce more vehicles for release now. And of course, if they can get to one to two capital ships a year, that would be very nice. But as we can already see, CIG are setting themselves up to build a bigger workforce with, I think, the Manchester studio. I think there are currently about, about 800 plus staff members across all the studios, but they did say that the Manchester studio alone can hold up to 1,500 staff. So as the game continues to develop, they continue to hire new people with these new incentives for training as well. It is just a matter of growing that team out. And leading on to that, the next question was to do with what is the purpose of the Montreal vehicle team? And they are really just additional resources to initially help work with the backlog of, of the ships, as well as get new ships out. But they are currently getting up to speed and learning the pipeline. And once they're there, they will continue to build out that ship team. And that will also help to tackle the backlog of ships, as well as continue to build out new ones. Now, the next question is, is there any progress on ship modularity? Now, if you don't remember, or if you weren't around back in 2014, ship modularity was actually the last stretch goal when they reached $65 million. And it is kind of a legacy piece of tech that a lot of ships are affected by. And he says that there is some very good news that with the whole seas development, they have figured out the last hurdle, which is the ability to have object containers loaded as items onto ships. Now, the issue holding them up was that the items in these object containers, which are essentially the assets inside a section of a ship that could be swapped in and out, they couldn't communicate with the rest of the ship when they were swapped in. And now they do. So now there is nothing technically stopping them from introducing ship modularity or more modularity. And this is a huge hurdle to overcome. And although it doesn't mean that it'll all come at once now, as resources are still required, so more team members, but technically, Ships with modularity like the Caterpillar, the Karak, the Retaliator, the Vanguards, and obviously the Galaxy being one of the newer ones, are now possible. Being able to swap out large sections of ships to change up its role entirely. So really happy to hear that this legacy piece of tech is now worked out. 
and ship modularity can finally come along. Now, the next question was to do with physicalized damage and how it's going. And John Crew says, leading on from the last question, this is the second part of good news. It is under heavy active development, he says, with the physics team having done a lot of work in the last six months on it. And they are now at the point where other feature and gameplay teams have joined them with the vehicle content team providing assets with ships set up in this new way that utilizes the physical damage tech. But he did say that this change is not just a vehicle thing, it is an everything thing. And basically it is changing the breakability system for everything, so vehicles, props, environments, and so on and so forth. And they are all working on it at the moment. And this system is called Maelstrom, which is something we have heard about in the monthly reports. It is not a new ship of any kind. It is the system, this new physical damage system. Now this is certainly going to be a huge change to the game for many areas, as it will mean that damage from all the various weapon types and more to come in the future will realistically and physically damage things like ships, the various props that we see in the environment. And although they did say it won't necessarily be applied to everything due to performance constraints, I really hope that they still intend to apply it to things like FPS armor. But this Maelstrom system is what John Crew was referring to as the apocalyptic change that will just move away from basically any form of meta and to a realistic, physically based damage system that will change up many tactics that we are using today. So very happy to hear that both this and ship modularity are now at the point where they can slowly begin starting to roll this out. This is great news as this is two huge pieces of tech that have been in the works for a long while and pretty much been a bit of a blocker for a lot of systems. So here's hoping we get to see this roll out pretty sharpish. Anyway, next question is, what is the state of the ship tractor beams and their large cargo counterparts? Now, they say that the ship tractor beams have had a lot of work recently with multiple vehicles having their implementation set up. Currently, it is working from a vehicle setup standpoint, but there is still work required from the EUPU team, who are the ones who are technically delivering them. So the ships that need them have them, but the gameplay associated with them is still requiring a little bit more work. And size-wise, they did say that the EUPU team have decided to make the ship tractor beams more akin to component sizes rather than weapon sizing. So the numbers will have changed, but what they can lift will still be consistent to what they were originally tended to lift. So for example, the biggest tractor beam is a size three tractor beam, and that is for moving ships. So like the Argo SRV, and then you have the size two tractor beam, that can move containers up to 32 SEU. And then I suppose size one will be anything up to a, they didn't mention, but to a certain size. So this means that the Caterpillar, the Cutlass, the Nomad, the 315P and the Constellation Taurus are all now set up and ready for the tractor beams to be integrated. And they are likely working to get this set up for the bigger cargo changes coming in this year, I believe from 320 onwards, and then it will make its way into the PU when ready. So another big win there. Next question is, will there be a way to dock the Reclaimer to a space station? And they said they originally wanted the Reclaimer to be capable of doing that when they first brought in the docking system, but there was quite a few bits of work that needed to get it ready for that, which is to do with geometry, being able to move things out the way and replace the locations of things. It will get done, they say, when they get the resources to do that. And they also did mention that the Reclaimer does require a bit of a rework, like the rear cargo lift that needs a lot of attention. So nice to hear that they're addressing some of the issues with these ships. A shame it needs to go through a bit of a, a rework process, but ultimately it will come out better in the end. Next question is simply Apollo question mark, which the RSI Apollo is your multi-crew medical ship. Now this has recently had one artist working on it in pre-production to get all the unanswered questions about it answered so that it's ready to go into production when the resources free up. And the same kind of goes for the Polaris. Now, this is also in pre-production. They are investigating it now, as with all capital ships, they want to tackle them in a way that allows them to scale up and do them all much quicker. And the last couple of weeks, they have been breaking down what this ship is, its concept, and what is going to be involved in delivering it. And it will go into full production very soon. So basically, they are just figuring out its foundations to make sure that when it goes into full-scale production, it is a smoother ride as possible. 
Next question. Some ship designs have flaws with component swapping, especially as some components just won't fit through doors or airlocks. What is going to happen here? Now, this is partly to do with the gold standard pass on ships that we have seen. For example, the Retaliator has had its airlocks and its doorways widened to allow items to pass through, but also some internal components, so size 3 and above, are not meant to be tractor beamed in and out of the ship, and they will require a space station or a dry dock in order to extract them. So basically, any component, size 0, 1 or 2, can be taken out with a tractor beam, and they will make sure that if a vehicle doesn't allow that, that has those size components, that it will, when it goes through its gold standard pass, that will be ensured that it works, but anything bigger than size 2, like size 3 and above, will require more of a repair station. Next question is, the C1 is said to have a size 3 tractor beam. Does that mean that this ship will be able to track to small vehicles? And they say no, the tractor beam will be changed to size 2, which is to track to anything up to 32 SEU boxes. So the sizing number has changed, but its capability intention is the same. Next question is, what does the Fury and Cutter shutters mean for the Karak? So if you don't know, the Fury MX has a kind of a blast shield. The Drake Cutter has those side shutters that can be folded up. The Karak cockpit is supposed to be able to have a full canopy sort of shutter deployment. Now, they say that they need to find time to do it, and they are now able to do it. And the developer who will work on this has been given the go-ahead to work on that and he will try and get it done as soon as possible. Now, this is great to know that it's no longer a tech holdup anymore, and again, just more of a resource issue. But he says when he takes a look at it, it will depend on how much work is required as to when he can slot that into getting it done. If it was something like a five-minute job, they would get it done quickly. It is certainly not going to be a five-minute job, but hopefully it won't take too long, and they'll be able to get it done as soon as possible. Next question is, is it still the plan to be able to tune ship components or vehicle components and they did say that this is more of a EUPU thing, as it is more in line with engineering, like we heard recently. But it is definitely the plan to have the different component grades and performance windows, like military grade, industrial grade, and so on. And they do have a very comprehensive plan, or the EUPU team have a very comprehensive plan for this engineering tuner repair gameplay that they are working on. So tuning items is going to be part of that role. And this does hack back to the recent engineering show we saw with Thorsten, where one of the engineering roles was to be somewhat of a tuner or a technician who will set up the components and their thresholds for whatever performance you want to get from your vehicle. And it will be very fun watching that system come to fruition. So next question, pretty much the final question is what ships and vehicles are in active production? So there were two redacted ones. One was a plural, so it could be a type of vehicle with variants. But the Spirit is in production, the SRV is finishing up, the Hull C is almost done. The Origin X1 is about to start, which is a cool, sleek hover bike. The Tumbrel Storm is approaching, or storming through Greybox, as they say. And we will hear more about the Santo Chiai in Alien Week in a few weeks. The Montreal team are also working on some variants of an existing ship, but no specification as to what it is. The Retaliator is getting worked on, and alongside the G12, which is a ground vehicle, another wheeled ground vehicle, that will be going into production soon, as well as the Polaris, the Apollo, the Gatak Raylin, and the X1, as mentioned recently. Now, in regards to the Banu Merchantman, this, I suppose, is the bad news of this show, and the backlog of the other ships. They say their plan is to start with RSI and get the Polaris done, then the Perseus and the Galaxy, with those three coming along, I suppose somewhat one after the other, as they will all share similar assets. The issue with the Banu Merchantman is that everything is unique in that ship, so it is a huge time investment, and with a few members leaving the crew, this has also held up the development of it. And all the time they would put into it only affects the Banu Merchantman. It doesn't actually apply to any other ship. And they really want to do the Banu Merchantman justice. So instead of working on that, they're putting resources into the backlog so that they can start catching up on those other ships. Now, personally, it is a shame that it is now on hold again. And I am an owner of the Banu Merchantman, but I would rather it be something truly special when it does come so I am happy to get multiple other ships on the backlog done first if they are able to get through them quicker than just getting the Banu Merchantman out. But that is just my opinion on that. 
So a great update there for all things ships and vehicles, and I am over the moon that ship modularity and the physical damage system or maelstrom system is now at a stage where it can begin rolling out. These are going to have a big impact on the PU going forwards in so many areas. I can't wait to see them get implemented. Now, next week's Inside Star Citizen, Jared says, is talking about Arena Commander updates, which I am interested in, but they're not anything that will get me hyped. But that was Star Citizen Live. Let us move on. So also this week, with Invictus launch week happening all week long, Tuesday's portfolio post was specifically about the history of said event. The RSI Lynx luxury ground vehicle and tumbrel storm light tank were introduced with the Q&A for the Lynx already available. Plus, the continued sales and daily manufacturer hall displays of the various military vehicles throughout the Invictus launch week are available to check out. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.